We'll get going. Um, so next up is Dr. Katie Wickwitz. Uh, Katie and I work together, obviously. <laughs> um, and uh, she's an associate professor of psychology at the University of New Mexico. Uh, she joined our department a couple of years ago. And um, she has a joint appointment at the Center on Alcoholism, Substance Abuse, and Addictions. She's a clinical psychologist, and her work focuses on addictions and relapse to substance use. Um, to date, she has authored three books, 15 book chapters, and over 70 peer-reviewed publications. She was recently awarded a presidential citation from the American Psychology Association for early career accomplishments, and just today learned that she will become division chair for Division 50 of the APA for the next year, so she's chair-elect. Um, and uh, her talk is about uh, collaboration that we formed, um, the integration of brain stimulation and imaging in clinical research and treatment of addiction. So join me in welcoming Dr. Wickowitz. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let people get to their seats. Uh, and thank you, Vince, and uh, the entire group here for organizing this really exciting meeting. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, I, I am very different, I think, from a lot of the other speakers today. I'm not a neuroscientist, so full disclaimer there. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I, I treat people with addiction. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. I, I'd like to acknowledge the team that we have back in New Mexico, the Psychology Clinical Neuroscience Center. Uh, we have a ton of people working with us, and, and they make this work possible. They're really great folks. Uh, so just a brief overview of what I hope to do today is to uh, uh, talk about bridging the gap a little bit between science and practice. We've heard a lot about really exciting new advances in electrical stimulation and new devices, and, and I can tell you I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag now. We used big electrodes and sponges, and um, we did everything you know, that people are saying, no, that's, there's a better way to do this now. Um, so we, we did things the old way, but we, we were working with real, with real clients um, in, a, in a clinical setting. So um, we're going to bridge the gap, hopefully, or I'm going to try to bridge the gap a little bit between science and practice. I'm going to provide a really brief overview of addiction uh, for those of you who are less aware of addiction and talk a little bit about the neurobiology of addiction. And then I'm going to talk about our work in mindfulness. And we've used mindfulness as a treatment for addiction now. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about why we might have turned to mindfulness as well as some of our studies in using mindfulness. At the behavioral level, we, we, our, our larger trials of mindfulness for addiction have not included imaging or stimulation. Uh, but we have conducted one small pilot study that I will talk about where we did combine mindfulness with TDCS for smoking. Uh, and that's been a very fun and, and interesting project, and we've learned a lot about how to bring um, uh, TDCS into a clinical setting. And then I'm going to just finish briefly with talking about working with clinical populations. I'd like to touch on dissemination a little bit. Dissemination and implementation is a, a big word in clinical practice, and it, it stands for actually doing what we do in, in the lab and in the clinic, in a research clinic, and how we get that out into the field. And as you talk about brain stimulation, uh, neuroimaging, I think it's really important to think about how is this ultimately going to get to patients. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to end a little bit in talking about some of the research side of working with clinical populations and then how we disseminate some of these, some of these tools. Uh, so briefly, drug and alcohol use disorders are problematic. Uh, this is a, just a map from the World Health Organization. Um, it's a fairly old map, and it's just males. But generally, addiction aff affects many people in the world. Um, in the U.S., the prevalence of current alcohol use disorder and current nicotine use disorder, um, either of those things, is about 10 to 15 percent of the population are currently impacted by those. Um, and how we define use disorders, including alcohol and nicotine use disorder, is by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And for those of you not familiar with those, those criteria, uh, it is 11 different uh, symptoms, and you have to have two or more of them to be diagnosed with a current alcohol use disorder or current nicotine use disorder in the past year. Uh, so you can go ahead and check it out, see, see how you fit, see how your family fits. Uh, 
this is just to show that about, about two to three people out of 20 are gonna be impacted by addiction. It's a major public health problem. Um, I think most people here know that. Many people, probably everyone in this room has been impacted by addiction in some way or another. So, big problem. Um, another big problem is that most people with addiction never get treatment. Uh, this is just youth, but it's, it's similar for adults. Uh, in this case, about 1.2 million people with alcohol use disorder never receive treatment. Uh, so roughly, most estimates suggest that 80 to 90 percent of people with addiction never actually receive treatment. Uh, part of that is their own desire to seek treatment, so a lot of people don't want treatment. Uh, part of that is stigma of going to treatment, and another piece of that is availability of treatment. Um, treatment is not easy to access for addiction, and it's, it can be expensive. The Affordable Care Act is, Affordable Care Act is going to change that dramatically, which is fantastic. Uh, but still, it's a, a problem that there is a lot of need for treatment. And not a ton of treatments available at this point. Um, and what's also very shocking and, and kind of sad and what I have focused my career on is the fact that of those who do get treatment, who actually make it into the door, the 10 to, 10 to 15, maybe even 20% of people who actually get treatment, it tends to not make them abstinent. <laughs> Uh, which is generally what people think of as, a, as the success of treatment. But of those who receive treatment for a substance use disorder, on the left here, this is for, um, this was a study done actually in 1971, uh, and it shows for heroin, smoking, and alcohol, and this is 12 months after treatment. Um, everyone got abstinent. Uh, the y-axis is percent abstinent. Everyone got abstinent during treatment, and by 12 months following treatment, um, anywhere between 20 and 35 percent of people were still abstinent. So having a lapse or relapsing is the modal outcome after treatment for addiction. Uh, I replicated this. This was 1971 and 2001. I thought, let's see how we're doing now, right? Like we've, we've been working on developing treatments for the past 30 years. Maybe we've gotten better at this. No. Actually, um, as we can see here, fewer people are ob obtaining abstinence in this, in this particular study, and that's partially because allow they allowed moderate drinking goals in this particular study. Um, but still, 12 months out, fewer than 20% um, were still ab were maintained abstinence. And, and so um, addiction is really difficult. It's uh, difficult to get people in the door for treatment. Once we get them in the door for treatment, it's really hard to treat. And a big part of that is the neurobiological adaptations that occur in the process of addiction. Uh, so uh, just to give you an idea of the models of dysfunction in addiction, there's lots of models in addiction of, of what's going on, but we generally know that there's, that there's massive neural system disruption in the frontal system, kind of all of the frontal system, uh, the brain reward system, and also the salience network. Basically. Addiction impacts many, many, many aspects of our brain and our brain functioning, our brain structure, and neurotransmitters. Uh, so this is a, a, a great diagram by, by Dr. Ron Volkov, the director of, of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, that kind of shows the brain reward pathways. All of these areas are impacted by addiction. Um, and this is a, a really simplified idea of what's going on with an addicted brain. Um, so in the non-addicted brain, and again, this is gross simplification here, um, we've got this really nice chunky arrow from control self-regulation to what our behavior is going to be, our drive. And, and that chunky arrow is giving us control, self-regulation of our behavior. People who are not addicted are fairly OK with self-regulation. Maybe other areas going to RDOC. Um, if we go to RDOC, we'll see other areas are, are also involved in impulsivity and have problems with, with regulatory control. But this is a big issue in addiction. Uh, in the addicted brain, that control becomes much less strong, and the salience of cues becomes very strong, the reward network becomes very strong, and so people literally have less control over their behavior. And, by the way, they have much less dopamine endogenously in the brain now because they've been flooding their brain with dopamine exogenously through drugs, and so anything, even you know, one of the biggest things you hear in talking with clinical populations of people with addiction is there's nothing in their life that brings them pleasure. Nothing. Like playing with their kids, being in Hawaii, like that does not bring them the level of pleasure that a hit brings them. Okay, and so imagine a li living a life that way. It's a very awful existence, and, and that's what we see in addiction, and, and the neurobiological adaptations are, are pretty intense. 
Um, tons of neuroimaging work has been done with addiction. These are, these are just some of the many, 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 many studies. There's been many reviews. Uh, some of the key points that, that we, oh, sorry. Um, Okay, some of the key things that we see in addiction and, and have studied neurobiologically are subject, subjective experiences of craving and stress, decision making, like I mentioned, frontal control, um, and then alcohol and drug cue induced activation. So uh, alcohol and drug cues are much more salient to people with addiction than to people who are non-addicted. Uh, so this is just a meta-analysis of cue induced reactivity to a variety of different drugs. And again, you can see when exposing people to a cue of their, of their preferred drug, we get all, all sorts of activations in a lot of various areas of the brain. Um, it, it, this wide neural dysfunction, I think, is the big takeaway message. So uh, people get themselves into this mess behaviorally, you know, so they, they, they develop these... Um, there's, there's a lot of work showing that how addiction kind of starts as a positive reinforcement system where people are, are using alcohol and other drugs to feel good uh, and then becomes a negative reinforcement process where people are using alcohol and drugs to feel not bad. And, and so through that process, their, their brain has changed and, and that's all their behavior. So could we potentially reverse that? Could we potentially use behavior, a behavioral intervention, to retrain the brain, to, to put their brain back on track? Uh, so we've been looking at targeting these same systems using meditation. And there's a lot of work on mindfulness meditation and the neurobiology of mindfulness meditation. These are just um, a couple of, of articles that have been done. Um, and I'm going to just jump to some of the effects of mindfulness meditation. So in the brain, it's been shown to be uh, associated with changes in brain structure, brain function, and connectivity in many areas. Uh, behaviorally, it's associated with increased intentional control, improved physical health, even improved immune function. Immune function. Really neat study uh, done by Richie Davidson's group where they blistered people and um, then put capsaicin in the blisters. I don't know how they got IRB approval for this, but it's a brilliant little study. And they found that people who went through an eight-week meditation course, those blisters healed quicker than people who did not go through the eight-week meditation course. So it, it actually has an effect on immune function, um, enhanced self-awareness, uh, self greater self-regulation, and reductions in perceived stress. So lots of good things associated with meditation. So that's good. Um, the definition of mindfulness uh, that's often used is paying attention in the present moment without judgment. So many of us are sitting here now. You might not notice the feeling of your feet on the floor if they're there. I invite you to just take a second to notice your feet on the floor if they're there. It's interesting, right? You might not have noticed that a second ago. Now you draw your attention to it. You can be with that, pay attention to it in the moment, and hopefully you're not having a lot of judgment about your feet on the floor. Maybe you are, um, but probably not. How might this relate to substance use? Well, if we just go through kind of each of these, uh, paying attention. If someone with addiction, one, one of the common things we hear is all of a sudden they're at the liquor store. They don't even know how they got there. They're just not attending to their environment. They're not aware of their environment, and they act automatically. So what if we could just bring a little bit more attention to the environment? Um, another aspect of addiction is that trying to get a fix, that, that trying to get rid of the negative mood. What if we could bring some acceptance to the present moment experience? And then without judgment, a big aspect of addiction is shame. Um, and so what if we could help people to just detach from the, the shameful experience of having an addiction, the problems they've caused in their lives because of their addiction? What if we could bring some non-judgment to that? So this has been our idea. Uh, there's lots of neuroimaging data in addiction as well, including some, some hallmark work. Uh, here I, I left the site off, I apologize, for a, a paper by Westbrook and colleagues where they looked at smokers and they brought them into the lab, into the scanner, and basically said, we want you to mindfully attend. They taught them some mindfulness techniques. We want you to mindfully attend uh, to the smoking cue or just look at it. And what we see is, is really um, nice activation of the insulin and the ventral striatum when people were mindfully attending uh, to the cues. But lots of other work in this area. 
Uh, so we developed a program uh, over 10 years ago now when we started working on this program called Mindfulness-Based Relapse Prevention. It com it's a manualized treatment that combines mindfulness meditation with relapse prevention skills. It's done in a group, uh, eight weekly, two-hour sessions. It incorporates both formal meditation practices like breathing meditation, walking meditation, body scan, as well as informal meditation practice, practices. One of the most loved practice is the sober breathing space, which is an acronym for stop, observe, breathe, expand, respond. Really nice for, for addiction to have an acronym like that, and people use that a lot. And it's really just in the moment, becoming more centered, um, checking in, moving out of automatic pilot, noticing your feet on the floor, but doing that systematically with, with the breath. Um, so we've, we've developed a manual, and we've now tested this in three clinical trials. So what I'd like to do is just talk very briefly about the data from those three clinical trials and then move into the, to the pilot work we've done. Um, so we've compared mindfulness-based relapse prevention, which I'll call MBRP, so that we're not here past five, uh, uh, which is, again, skills training with mindfulness, and we've put that up against in randomized trials relapse prevention. Um, this is a cognitive beh behavioral skills training kind of considered a gold standard for addiction uh, without mindfulness. So it's really MBRP, which has the mindfulness, versus relapse prevention, or RP, that, that is minus mindfulness. Um, and then we've also uh, compared it to kind of what's standard in the community. We call it treatment as usual, so standard aftercare in the community, which often includes psychoeducation, also relapse prevention, 12-step groups. And we've done most of our work at the Recover Centers of King County in Seattle, and that's why um, we've got that there. All right, so we've done three trials now. The first was a pilot efficacy trial that just compared MBRP to treatment as usual. Uh, the second one was what I would call a hybrid efficacy trial. It was done in a, a residential setting for female criminal offenders, and that put, to, that put MBRP versus RP just head to head. All of these are randomized. Um, and then we did the big trial, the, the large efficacy trial, where we compared all three groups. Um, so in all three studies, I'm just going to put this up here quickly, uh, we found significant reductions in substance use, in lapse rates, and heavy drinking, and in all three cases, um, mindfulness-based relapse prevention yielded the best outcomes um, with, with medium effect sizes when you look, pre-post effect sizes are quite large in many of the studies, but the efficacy test of, of treatment versus treatment um, effect sizes are, are in the small to medium range. Um, but this corresponds, like in this study, this hybrid efficacy trial, uh, which was a smaller N, um, we had one relapse in the, mi the mindfulness group, one person who relapsed, that was it. And she used prescription opiates for one day. That was her relapse. Um, in the RP group, we had 20% relapsed, and they all went back to full-blown drug use. So um, it's, it's working behaviorally is what we're seeing, is, is my point. Okay, we're also seeing really nice changes in craving. This is just um, one of the studies where we see uh, on the Penn alcohol craving scale significant reductions in craving um, out to four months. And we're also seeing this really important and interesting effect, a moderation effect, whereby this red line here, this is people in mindfulness, and they're experiencing depression at the same rates as those in the control group, but they're not using in response. And that's the key of the treatment. We, want, we, we, we recognize we're not going to get rid of depression. We're not going to get rid of craving. But if we could teach people to not use when they experience depression, that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to change their reactivity to their own internal states as well as to cues. And that's what this effect shows. The, the uh, um, correlation in the controlled group between depression and drug use was 0.5. And in the mindfulness group, it was negative 0.09. So uh, kind of just eliminating that association. So this is really good, right? So we've, we've got a modestly, modestly efficacious treatment. Uh, it reduces craving and uh, the relation between depression. So that's all good. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is treatment engagement and completion. Uh, we're about 10 to 15% less in the mindfulness group as compared to relapse prevention. So we get about 60% treatment engagement versus 70 to 75% in the alternative groups. People are having a hard time with this. And having facilitated groups myself, I can tell you that people with drug addiction have a hard time meditating, um, especially when they're early in their recovery. Uh, so how many of you have meditated? OK. So you might 
find this picture kind of familiar, right? You sit down to meditate, oh, this is gonna great, bring me great peace and joy, and instead, oh God, I've gotta do this, and oh my gosh, I've gotta do this, all this stuff. It's just, it's a constant spinning out of control of fret and worry and future and past. Take someone who has uh, addiction, probably unstably housed, marriage breakup, children don't talk to them, all sorts of employment difficulties, financial problems, health, health problems, and ask them to sit on a cushion for 30 minutes a day and meditate. It's really hard to get them engaged initially. When we can get them engaged, it's amazing. They're in, and, and they get it. And our effects, we have one study where we found effects that lasted out to 12 months following treatment, if we can get them that, to that initial engagement. So a couple years ago, I met Vince. Uh, I was my first year in the in the department at the University of New Mexico, and Vince was giving a lecture on TDCS. And I thought, wow, this sounds really, really interesting. And so Vince and I talked, and anecdotally, he told me about some of his prior studies where meditators who use TDCS as part of his study mentioned that it was kind of like meditating. So I was like, okay, I gotta try this. So. Um, Vince and, and his graduate student at the time uh, hooked me up, and sure enough, it, it was very interesting. Uh, has anyone been on a multi-day meditation retreat? Like five, seven, ten day retreats? No? Okay. Um, they're great. Uh, anyways, so I, 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 during and after TDCS, I thought, oh my gosh, it's like day four. It really had that, the heightened awareness that comes from days of silence and you with your own thoughts, which can be miserable at times, but enlightening at others. Uh, there's this heightened awareness that comes, colors are more, more bright, food tastes better, things that you're just recognizing more in your environment. That's what it was like for me the first time I did TDCS. So I thought there might be something to this as far as that engagement piece. If we could use this, if we could combine this with mindfulness, could we potentially get people to engage more with the intervention. Um, so this is one of our uh, graduate student RAs, not a real participant, um, hooked up. And the idea here is instead of this spinning out of control and, and total lack of ability to bring your attention back to what you're focusing on, uh, what if we could choose a target such as the breath with some heightened awareness because we're getting stimulated? And then when our attention wanders, we, we can we have more gentleness uh, to bring our attention back. So our attention's gonna wander a hundred times, but we bring it back and, and that spiraling out of control might not happen. All right, so a number of things initially came up as soon as we started talking about maybe doing this clinically with people with addiction in a group format. Um, first of all, which stimulation montage obviously is a big question. We wanted to specifically pick a montage that would enhance mindfulness training. We wanted to enhance the experience of mindfulness. How do we do group-based MBRP with TDCS? Um, and then finally, a, a third thing that's maybe a little bit unique to doing mindfulness-based treatments is when you're leading, when you're the therapist of a mindfulness-based intervention, you're actually participating in the exercises as you're leading them. So when I'm leading a body scan in a mindfulness group, I'm doing the body scan myself. So an initial question that came up for me is, should the facilitator, should the therapist also do TDCS? while leading these groups. So that was a question. All right, so let's talk about the montage briefly. Um, Vince, in his prior studies, had used F10, right, I, right inferior frontal gyrus. Uh, that's the montage I had tried. It seemed to um, enhance mindfulness, at least in my experience and, and anecdotally in other experiences as well. Um, but there's also good reason to think that that might be a good montage to choose from based on the neurobiological literature and substance use disorder or SUD as well as mindfulness meditation or MM. Here's uh, modeling of that montage from, from Marome's group and we can see definite um, insula, ventromedial PFC, striatum. Uh, so we're thinking that maybe this, in addition to all the anecdotal work, is a, a good place to start. Okay, how do we do group? Uh, up to eight participants at a time, 30 minutes of stimulation, two milliamps, and we wanna be able to monitor sensation ratings. So our post, uh, graduate student then postdoc at the time, Brian Kaufman, created what we affectionately called the Octobox, which you see here, it's very low tech. 
Uh, we're not seeking any patents on this yet, but if anyone here who does that wants to talk with us, I'd be thrilled um, to create something a little bit nicer than a Tupperware box with uh, electrical tape on it. Um, but we, we do this because this way each of the, each of the stimulation boxes is color coded and that way um, if someone in the group is having difficulty with the stimulation we can quickly you know, pull their, pull, turn their stimula stimulator off um, without disrupting the rest of the group and that was the point of the octo box and also sitting in a group circle you know, we needed to be able to get the units so each of the electrical cords are a little bit longer depending on how far you are from the box. Um, that final question of the, the facilitator engagement with practices while leading. Uh, so we tried that out, and uh, I, I was leading, and so we had me hooked up, um, as well as a group of mock, a uh, group of research assistants hooked up, and I was trying to lead them through a meditation, and it was really hard. <laughs> Apparently, this montage, in some ways, in inhibits verbal ability. Um, so try leading a meditation practice and meditating yourself while having your verbal ability impaired. <laughs> it was really difficult. It created the worst headache. I could barely get words out. We decided, okay, we're going to let that piece go. The MBRP facilitator does not have to do TDCS while leading. In fact, that's a, that's a very bad idea. All right, um, so this is a mock group uh, here. Um, we did a weekly group for four weeks. The treatment is typically eight weeks. We thought, you know, we're going to speed it up with stimulation. Let's do a four-week intervention. Let's get it done pretty quickly. Uh, the, the treatment consisted of 30 minutes of mindfulness with right F10 active TDCS at 2 milliamps and was followed by we discontinued stimulation after 30 minutes and then did 60 minutes of the regular mindfulness intervention contacts, uh, content. Uh, we did EEG at baseline and at end of treatment in this study. Uh, so what did we find? We, we ran one group, or no, I'm sorry, we ran two groups with a total sample size of eight. Uh, so this is small, and we do not have a sham control at this point. Um, but we found a large effect size reduction in cigarettes per smoking day in this group, a, a D of 0.95, um, and a 33% abstinent rate at the end of treatment, which is very good <laughs> for smokers. 33% uh, cessation rate is about what you get with varenicline, which is kind of the best pharmacotherapy for smoking. Uh, varenicline has its own side effects and problems, um, which is why uh, having a behavioral intervention yield a 33% cessation rate is pretty good. Um, unfortunately, those effects were not maintained after treatment for one month post-treatment, and so I have a thought that we need to go back to the full eight weeks that four weeks was just too short. And, and when you think about it, the goal of this was to engage, the goal of adding t TDCS was to engage people in the mindfulness, but they still might need the full eight weeks of mindfulness. Four weeks might just be too short. Um, so we do have some EEG findings, and I'd like to thank Michael Hunter for, for doing these analyses for us. This is just one of the people, and this is during a Q task, so we're assessing Q reactivity. Um, on the top here is the, the smoking-related cues, and on the bottom are neutral cues, and what we see at follow-up is, is really nice uh, frontal source current uh, after the intervention, so maybe some more frontal engagement, which is what we're aiming for in this intervention. We want more top-down control of behavior and reactions to cues. Uh, so just an overview of generally, TDCS has been used for addiction uh, in a lot of different areas, and in all of these studies, though, it's really been used independently. No one has tried to combine it with an existing behavioral intervention, at least that I know of in, in this published work. And I think that there is value um, to combining it with an intervention to enhance whatever you're training them. In, in that way, we might get much more enduring effects. In all of these studies, they have found kind of reductions in Q reactivity and improvements in decision making, but those were very short lived, basically assessed right after stimulation discontinued. So, really briefly, uh, I am getting us on time, Vince, by the way. Uh, I wanted to talk just really briefly about what it's like doing TDCS, doing stimulation and imaging work with clinical populations because we're doing both of those things in our, in our lab. Uh, a first thing to keep in mind is comorbidity. Most, most clinical populations have extensive medical and psychiatric comorbidity. And one reaction to that is just to exclude them, right? Like, we don't want people in our lab, who are, you know, we don't want the person coming in with an alcohol use disorder who also has chronic pain and depression and perhaps some bipolar episodes, right? Like we don't want that person in the lab. 
Well, that's a decision to make, but now you've created a treatment that's not going to generalize to most of the people out there who have extensive medical and psychiatric comorbidity. Uh, so I think that's something, one thing to really keep in mind when you're doing this kind of work is you are going to have folks come who, are, who have these comorbidities, and, and then you have to make the call of, do I care more about having a more valid test of my intervention, or do I care more about it being generalizable back to the community? Um, a second issue with clinical populations is, is at least people with addiction tend to have a lot of behavioral and emotion dysregulation problems. So in one of the first sessions we led, actually it was the very first session, real session of TDCS and, and mindfulness that we led. We had a, um, one of the patients who just kind of freaked out um, by the stimulation and, and really just couldn't handle it. Um, and we, we turned off his stimulator and, and he stayed the rest of the group and was fine and kind of apologized afterwards, but he was just like, I just got really upset and I just I got overwhelmed and I couldn't handle it. And, and that's really common and, and so that's another thing to think about. It That happens a lot in the scanner as well. Um, we often use the mock scanner prior to any um, scanning at, at, a, at our scanning facility for people with addiction for that reason. Um, and then for a lot of the clients, at least clients I work with, uh, their hierarchy of needs is a, is a concern. Many of the people I work with are unstably housed. Uh, like I said, f financial, financial difficulties, uh, employment difficulties, relationship difficulties, and, and so sometimes your, your study and your fancy new TDCS intervention is n not the first thing on their mind. Um, you know, getting some food and housing is the first thing on their mind, so that, that impacts compliance and engagement. Uh, but just to close back on that issue of dissemination, and, and one of the reasons I'm kind of drawn to this work in particular, you know, mindfulness is already in the homes. Many of you raised your hands that you've meditated before, and, and mindfulness is certainly something that doesn't require you to go to a treatment center. And TDCS, as you know, uh, in the last talk, there were pictures of the home kit, and we, we hear a lot about um, DIY, TDCS, but I also think we're, and, and we could talk about that and the, some of the problems, but I don't think we're too far, right, from maybe a safe um, kind of home home unit that, that people could be using safely, or maybe we're already there and I'm not aware of it. Um, and so I really like the idea of combining these because of the opportunities for potentially disseminating to a wide group of people who might not want to go to a treatment center. I don't know if you guys have been to treatment centers, but they tend not to be the nicest places in the world unless you have the money to go to Betty Ford. Uh, and so the idea of being able to do this in your own home, uh, to me, is a really valuable aspect of, of this combination. And we do have a lot of work yet to do. Uh, we, we are you know, putting in a grant to do a much bigger trial. We're hoping to do neuroimaging pre and post. And there's lots more that we could be doing. Uh, right now, this is the first pass. And, and we're pretty excited about the results. So we're, we're moving forward. And um, I thank you for your time. <laughs>